Welcome to this session about the miners' strike and Harry Patterson's book, newly published book, Look Back in Anger, uh, about the Nottinghamshire side of things. I, I did a book called The Dirty Thirty, which were about the Leicestershire striking miners, and uh, which is now a folk song in a film. <laughs> but um, don't want to say much, just want to introduce Harry. He's going to do about 20 minutes, then we may have a bit of a discussion about the differences between Leicestershire and Nottinghamshire. Um, Harry himself comes from Alloa. That's correct. Right. And uh, he, oh, as well as writing uh, political things, he's also a rock critic. I don't just mean it, it says Skaggy Rock is better than Blackpool Rock. You know, but, uh, he's a music journalist, um, writing for quite a few. Yeah, uh, classic rock. rock. Classic Central. rock and various uh, magazines. Um, and afterwards, uh, he has got copies of Look Back in Anger for Sale, and I have to say what a brilliant book it is. The analysis, political and historical analysis in it. It's going to be one of the top two books about the minor strike. The other one, Seamus Mill, which some of you will know, The Enemy Within, about what MI5 and MI6 got up to during the strike. Um, but this one is fantastic. There are copies for sale over there. Now, I have brought some copies of the Dirty 30 and the DVD that they made from it. But, can I ask you not to buy anything of mine until you've bought <laughs> Harry's book? Because I've read his blogs and he, he does have an hour version of the Glasgow Kiss. <laughs> <laughs> the headbutt. So, I don't want to upset him. You see? So, uh, you can buy his first. Anyway, I'll shut up now and the main turn is thanks. Harry Patterson. Thanks very much. Um, well, thanks for inviting me and thanks uh, people for attending. Um, just a little bit about me then. Yeah, as David said, I'm originally from Alloa um, in, in, in a Scottish coal field where the old man worked at the Devon Pit. I moved here in 1978, or here being Nottingham, uh, when I was just 11 years old. Um, my father-in-law um, was active during the strike. He was out on strike from Lundby Colliery for the full year. Uh, and my mother-in-law, Iris, was very active in the women's support group, um, again, for the full year. The, the genesis of the book lies, sadly, with my father-in-law's death in 2012. Um, we were sat in the miners' welfare, and it was a typical Nottinghamshire miners' funeral, uh, in the sense that down one side, there were all the people that worked during the strike, and then down the other, with a great big gulf of room separating them with the strikers. Uh, and the two, uh, never the two shall meet. Um, so I was sat talking to his, to his old strike buddies and one of them said, well, you know, you're a writer and a journalist, why don't you have a go at writing a book about the strike? And my in, intention at the time was just to dismiss it. There have been many, many books written about the miners' strike. Um, the, the last count, when I was researching for this one, uh, there were 112 still in print in the UK alone. Um, so I didn't think I had anything more to add, but then my publisher, Ross Bradshaw, uh, who's got a stall downstairs just still on your left as you're going out the door, um, pointed out that there had, hadn't actually been um, a book written about Nottinghamshire uh, during the strike. Um, and for those of you who, who are old enough um, and can re remember that dispute, you'll be aware that Nottingham was absolutely critical to the entire course of the strike. It was the second largest coal field um, in the UK at the time. Uh, there were 32,000 men there, 27 pits. Um, but perhaps more importantly, it was the number one most profitable coal field um, in the entire UK. Um, and the battle for the soul of Nottinghamshire was, was waged you know, furiously throughout that year. It was of vital importance to the NUM as much as it was to Margaret Thatcher. And indeed, Nottinghamshire, the majority of them scabbed, as we, as we say in uh, working class parlance, worked through the dispute and, and gave Thatcher the lifeline that was critical in breaking the strike. So that was the background um, to the book. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I wanted to do with it was I didn't want to make it an academic study um, with lots and lots of footnotes and treading that, that, that fine line of impartiality because I've got, I'm, I am partial, I have a view um, and my view is pro-strike. But having said that, I wanted to make sure that the book was as thoroughly and as well researched as possible so that when the inevitable uh, brickbats started arriving from the Tory press and the reviewers, that at least nobody would be able to attack it on grounds of factual accuracy. So those were two things um, that motivated me. The other thing, I think, is that virtually all the books that have been written about the strike 
um, are obviously written by people who've got a vested interest, just like me, in, in putting forward a particular narrative. But unlike me, most of these other books, I mean, I'll give you a couple of examples. There was Becky and Hank uh, did March into the Fault Line for the 25th anniversary of the strike, and that was lauded and fated in the Telegraph, the Express, and the Daily Mail. Um, and in terms of factual accuracy, it's, it's not only poor, it's actually quite insulting. Um, there are myths and distortions and outright lies, and that's a common theme to books about the strike. So one of the other things I wanted to do was really strip away all the mythology um, and all the, the, the propaganda that had built up over the last 30 years about the strike. So if I could just touch on a couple of those things very briefly. Popular narrative would have us believe that, for example, Arthur Scargill denied his men a ballot. Um, it's, it's entered virtually unchallenged into um, the received wisdom of contemporary and social uh, history of Britain. And it's absolutely factually, not opinion, I can't stress this you know, strongly enough, it's factually, historically, objectively untrue and inaccurate. The reason that there was no national ballot for the strike um, has its origins in the Special Delegates Conference of the NUM on the 19th of April uh, 1984. Prior to that, the NEC had had a vote on whether they were going to have a national ballot and of the 24 NEC members at the time, 21 voted against having a national ballot, 3 voted in favour. Arthur Scargill as chair had no vote one way or the other um, and despite having an overwhelming majority on the NEC in favour of having no ballot, um, he decided that it was too big, a, too big an issue. Um, its consequences were too momentous for it to be decided by just the NEC. So in contrast to a lot of the distortions that have built up about him being an undemocratic um, tyrant and a dictator, he decided that he wanted as much consensus and involvement in the debate you know, as, as, as could possibly be achieved. So he ordered that they had a special delegates conference on the 19th of April 1984, where delegates and representatives from every single NUM branch and pit throughout the entire UK would get together and decide on the way forward. And of course, um, what happened was the conference took place and by a card vote, um, the decision not to hold a national ballot was carried by 256 votes to 163, a two to one you know, majority effectively by the men themselves, you know, these weren't branch secretaries or full-time officials, these were rank and fire miners. They decided that they didn't want to have a national ballot. So there's the first myth of the strike scotched straight away. But you'll, you'll search in vain for most contemporary, in, throughout most contemporary narratives to find, to find that truth. Now why the ballot was denied um, was, was a combination of many, many factors. Um, the lads in the threatened coal fields with the pits under threat felt that it would be wrong and unfair to allow those in the profitable pits to vote them out of a job, which is effectively what a national ballot would have ended up being, a referendum on who gets a job and who doesn't. Um, there was also the case that by the time the delegates conference had happened and that vote had been taken, the strike was already underway. 175,000 miners were out on strike. Their attitude at the time, again ironically given the uh, the propaganda that's rained down on Scargill's head was that the NEC would try to sell them out and they didn't want to ballot. They were already on strike. They voted with their pit at pit heads and in canteens and miners' welfare. And then, of course, there was a hardening of attitudes on the question of the ballot once the Tory press really ramped itself up, demanded that the miners have one. Their attitude then was, well, we're not. You, who are you to tell us? Um, that we should have a ballot. So that's, what, that's one example um, of, of some of the myths and some of the, uh, the untruths that have, that have built up over the years that I've tried to, to untangle. In terms of the writing of the book as well, what I also wanted to do was try and make it as human as possible um, and as, uh, insofar as anybody, any author can be objective about his own work. I'm happy with, with, with that I've achieved that in the sense that there are many, many interviews with the lads that were involved at the time, women from the uh, women support groups, local councillors, every single shade of opinion and people that were involved in the dispute I interviewed tirelessly and most of the stories are in there linked to the narrative um, because at the end of the day, you know, history is important but it is people that make history, it isn't something that's dry and something that's ossified and something that's just left preserved in aspect on a shelf somewhere. Um, it's something that can speak very deeply to us even many years later. Um, and I make no um, apologies for the political uh, tone of my next remark. I think when we look around the country today and we see the results um, of the miners' strike and the, and, the, and the processes at the end of that dispute set in motion, zero hours contracts, no manufacturing base, 
um, people in poverty still working full time, then I think the lessons um, from, from that seismic dispute are as relevant now um, as they were then. Um, I think the other thing that interested me when I started writing the book, and I was, I was quite stunned to realise, but the whole history of mining in Britain has been one of continual decline. In 1923, there were one million people mining in Britain, one million miners. By the time of the general strike, that had dropped to something like 800,000. Um, and then uh, from 1947, when the mines were nationalised, all the way up through the Wilson years, there were another nearly 300,000 miners lost their jobs. Um, so by the time we arrive at 1984 uh, and the strike, there were 174 mines and 238,000 miners. Now, of course, um, we've got three mines um, and less than 2,000 miners in the entire UK. Um, it's, it's, it's almost incomprehensible. And when you consider, too, um, that of that, that um, of those closures, the three mines that are left remaining, we've got this conservative estimates put, give 300 years of reserves of British coal under our feet. Um, more extreme examples give anything up to 1,000 years. But one thing that isn't in dispute is that there are hundreds of years uh, of reserves left under our feet, and yet we're importing 50 million tonnes of coal a year. It's, it's insane. But that, of course, brings me on to the next point that I wanted to make, which was that the miners' strike had absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with economics. The economics of coal were, if they even factored at all in the Conservative government's uh, considerations, were very, very long, long way down the list. In reality, what the miners' strike was, was the defining class battle of the Thatcher years, um, as she decided, quite correctly, that in order to roll out the neoliberal policies with which we are living today, in order to roll back the gains of the post-war consensus, uh, the welfare state, drive down wages, increase profits, free up the money supply and all these things, what was absolutely vital was the smashing of the British trade union movement. Uh, and the NUM as its most militant industrial expression was very much the vanguard um, and the big boy in the playground. Hence, the strike was provoked. And again, another myth that is, well, Arthur Scargill was, was some kind of tactless, incompetent blunderer. He called the strike in the spring when coal stocks were high. How stupid was that? Again, it's simply not true. What actually happened um, was the miners knew that the, the dispute was coming. So in the previous autumn, they'd uh, balloted their membership to have an overtime ban to try and get coal stocks down. And the irony is that that was so successful in driving down the stocks that Thatcher and McGregor met three months before the strike and said, look, you know, the stocks are going to have run out well before we even get to winter. And they'll win. It will take about 12 weeks and they'll have won. What can we do? So it was decided that the strike needed to be provoked before the winter set in and demand for coal was high. So to that end, they announced the closure of Cortonwood Colliery. And given that 850 men had only been transferred there two weeks previously to its closure announcement from Ellisgar Pit, where they'd been promised five years further work, well, they knew exactly that that was going to ignite a storm um, of condemnation from the miners. And then, of course, as you know, the cliche goes, the rest was, the rest was history. But Nottinghamshire itself, um, which is what the book is primarily concerned with, um, although I set it within the context of the, of the national narrative at the time, um, has got a long and strange history um, in the trade union movement. It's damned in purest circles for being Scab County because it gave rise to the Spencerist trade union which scabbed on the general strike in 1926 um, and set up a separate trade union funded by the bosses um, which broke mining <coughs> resistance during the general strike that year. Similarly as well, when the, um, when the Scab Spencerist union was finally readmitted to the NUM's forerunner, the Miners Federation of Great Britain, in 1937, um, the Spanish um, Civil War was looming, um, and when the Republic fell and the fascists uh, were starting to sweep across the land, the Mining Federation of Great Britain decided to impose a political levy on all of its members so that they could raise arms to circumvent the British embargo and send finance out to the Spanish uh, Republicans uh, and the International Brigades of all the 37 separate sections of miners throughout the UK at the time, Nottinghamshire was alone in boycotting the levy. Um, for whatever reason it was, Nottinghamshire decided it couldn't support the fight against uh, fascism and the enemy of the international working class. Um, and there have been many other examples, and yet, bizarrely enough, um, when the strike kicked off, it had a left-wing general secretary, it had a left-dominated area council, 
um, and most of the key officers at branch level were left wingers. Um, but yeah, as we know, Nottingham broke the strike. They had a ballot, a, an area ballot, and they decided that their ballot took primacy over the NUM's rule book, which was, again, considering they've been built up in popular right-wing mythology as defenders of democracy and heroes of fair play. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a stench of hypocrisy about that because the NUM's rule book states that any area rule book which is in conflict with the national rule book then the national rule book shall take precedence. So once the strike had been declared official after the Special Delegates Conference in April 1984, that should have been the end of the matter. But Nottingham decided to cite its own regional autonomy as justification for breaking the strike. Um, and I'll just make one final point, because I see that we're, we're, we're getting there. One of the other things I think that it's important to realise as well is the involvement um, of the state and the Conservative Party in the fracturing of the Nottinghamshire coalfield during the strike. Roy Link, as you'll learn if you read the book, was engaged with James Cowan, who was the NCB's industrial director, sorry, industrial relations director at the time of the strike. He was engaged in discussions with James Cowan as early as 1981 um, in attempts to form a breakaway scab union and break the primacy of the NUM in the industry. Um, and then, of course, way after the strike had finished, um, there was correspondence, again, which, you, which, are, which are documented in the book, that Link had prior to privatisation with the then um, state, and state um, minister, for, the minister of state for uh, industry and energy, Tim Eggar, where Roy Link was writing to him saying, look, you know, for privatisation to be really successful, we need to put, put the wage bill down. This is a trade union leader advising a Tory minister on putting his own members' wages down. He said, we need to do something about the contract so we can make compulsory redundancies, so the guys don't have recourse to the courts or employment tribunals, and we need to come up with a plan for breaking NACOTs. So here you have a supposed trade union leader actually conniving with the government to sack his own members and drive down their wages in terms and conditions. This is just absolutely unparalleled. And then, of course, Roy Link received his OBE, uh, for services to trade union from, from a grateful Tory establishment um, and thereafter not widely known but then took up a, a lucrative uh, part-time directorship with British Coal once his members had thrown him out of office um, over the final round of pit closes in the early 90s. So all these things in Nottingham um, are woven together as the history of the coal fields and the fact that it consisted of miners from all over the UK that had migrated from different coal fields, Durham, uh, parts of the North East, parts of the North West, Scotland, um, all over. Um, and Henry and Ray Chadburn, the area president at the time, says that one of the reasons for Nottingham scabbing was that the coal field was almost the last chance saloon for miners that had lost a job, sometimes in cases as many as seven times. They'd been industrial gypsies, they'd moved all around the UK. When one pit was closed, they went to another one. Then they ended up in Nottingham, and their attitude very much was, nobody fought for my job when I lost my job at Kent. Then when I moved to Yorkshire, nobody fought for my job there. Now here I am, earning good money, and I've got some security. So, you know, stuff here, I'm going to carry on working. So there are all these factors, and it's an incredible tale. Um, there, there's humour, there's anger, there's sadness, um, and some of the acts of heroism and selflessness that, that you'll find in the book um, were absolutely, um, well, humbling really. Um, and I think today, um, on the 30th anniversary of the miners' strike, um, I think it's just a shame really that, we, uh, that the country didn't realise and wake up at the time and realise that what the NUM were doing was attempting to wage a defensive crusade on behalf of the working class in Britain everywhere. Um, and the failure um, of the sections of the Labour leadership and the TUC General Council at the time to give the NUM the backing that they deserved, well, we're living with those consequences today. So thank you for your time. If you've got questions, we have to take.